Now let's work through our example. What we have here is a set of hypothetical investment alternatives for three firms, the market, and then T-bills. So our three firms are HT, which stands for high tech, COLL, which stands for collections, and USR, which stands for rubber, or US rubber. And so what we have are the expected returns for each firm, T-bills and the market, in these possible future states of the economy, as well as the probability for that each state will actually occur. So what I want you to pay attention to here is that high tech kind of performs as we would expect. It does poorly in a recession um, and then does increasingly better as the market improves. Collections, though, is the opposite, and U.S. rubber is kind of in the middle. So that's our starting point. That's the information that's given to us. So now, uh, let's think, let's consider a couple of questions. Why is the T-bill return independent of the economy? And do T-bills promise a completely risk-free return? Well, the T-bill return is going to be independent of the economy because it's considered to be a risk-free security. So it's, going to, it's, it's promising a 5.5% yield regardless of what happens in the economy. And so they don't provide a completely risk-free return because as we learned in Chapter 6, they're still going to be exposed to inflation or the in inflation risk. And there are also going to be some reinvestment risk. But, but we do consider T-bills to be a risk-free security because there's no default, um, because it's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government and it's short term. So now, how do the returns of high tech and collections behave in relation to the market? Well, remember I mentioned to take a look at those. High tech kind of moves with the market, which is normal, but collections moves opposite, and that's a little unusual. But we want that in this example so I can show you some things to think about. So now let's move on to our calculations. First, we need to calculate expected return, which we're going to denote as R hat. And so by formula, R hat is going to be calculated as the probability of a given state times the return in that state summed across all states. So what we're seeing here is the expected return for high tech. And so we have a 10% probability of a recession. And then the expected return in a recession is negative 27%. And then we go through the other one, two, three, four possible states of the economy, taking the probability of that state times our forecasted return in that state. And then we're going to sum up those products, and we get an expected rate of return of 12.4%. So now if you use that same formula and apply it to the other four, you get the following expected rates of return. Of course, for T-bills, it's still going to be 5.5% because we're promised 5.5% regardless of the economy. So high tech has the highest expected return, and so just based on return alone, it looks like that's the best choice. But from an investing perspective, we can't make our decision just based on expected return. We have to know something about risk. And so until we account for risk, we can't really be sure which is the best investment. So now let's move on to standard deviation to estimate standalone risk. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So standard deviation is the square root of the variance um, of the expected return from the forecasted return multiplied by the probability of that forecasted return summed across all of those um, future states of the world. And again, we're going to take the square root so we get standard deviation. So now, um, and I don't know why we bother to calculate the standard deviation for T-bills because there, there is no variation, so we already know that the standard deviation is zero. But we're working through the formula here, so what we're doing is we're taking R minus R hat, 
squaring that, because we don't care if the deviation is positive or negative, multiplying it by the probability, and we do that for each of those five states. We sum those up and take the square root. So for T-bills it's zero, high tech it's 20%, the market is 15.2, and so on. So now we have risk and return. So if we want to compare those standard deviations, we see that the T-bill is just going to be a straight line if we plotted that um, curve. But for U.S. rubber, um, it had a, an expected return of 9.8%, so that's the peak of our curve. And then if we take plus or minus 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations, we can plot the rest of that curve. So we see that the curve for high tech is shifted out to the right because it has a higher expected return. But the curve is lower than um, the U.S. rubber curve because um, if we go back a second, we can see that high tech has a higher standard deviation. So what that means, with a higher standard deviation, that makes it more risky and makes, it, makes that curve have those fat tails. So you have more possibility of those very low and very high returns. So that means there's more uncertainty. So what we found is that standard deviation measures the total or the standalone risk. And the larger that standard, de standard deviation, the lower the probability that the actual returns will be close to expected returns. Or if we say that in another way, the larger the standard deviation, the wider that curve, so the wider the possible range of expected returns. So the larger standard deviation is what I just said, associated with that wider probability distribution. So now that we have expected return and standard deviation, now let's compare. So looking at that risk and re or thinking about that risk and return trade-off that we talked about before, um, it's not quite right or not quite lining up because our riskiest security, well actually that works. Our riskiest security is high tech. It has standard deviation of 20% and it has the highest expected return. But notice the asterisks on collections in U.S. rubber. U.S. rubber has the next highest um, standard deviation and it should then have the next highest expected return, but the market actually has um, the next highest expected return. So something's not quite right. But let's come back to that when we take, take a look at another measure of risk. Um, and before that though, let's just say now with this information, which security would you choose? Would you choose the one with the highest expected return, which is high tech, or would you choose the one with the lowest risk? Um, the T-bills or even collections. We need a measure that allows us to consider expected return and standard deviation simultaneously. And that's what the coefficient of variation does. It lets us me measure risk per unit of return. And most of us want the least amount of risk for a given amount of return which means we want this coefficient of variation to be as low as possible because we want the lowest amount of risk per unit of return. So if we're using coefficient of variation as a measure of relative risk, if we look at these two curves, and this is separate from the example that we've been working through, um, the standard deviation of A is equal to the standard deviation of B. Notice they've got the same height, same um, spread of the curves, but A is riskier because it has a larger possibility of losses. Look, the red curve crosses over the zero line, whereas the B curve does not. So that means the, that you have the same amount of risk for lower returns. So that's why we want coefficient of variation because it, it makes our risk relative to the returns that we're going to see or expect.
So now if we calculate coefficient of variation, risk per unit of return, which is standard deviation divided by expected return, now this is where our choices fall out. And so now remember we said we wanted the lowest risk per unit of return. So now it looks like of those three risky securities, high tech collections and US rubber, we would want to invest in high tech because collections actually has the highest degree of risk per unit of return and high tech has the lowest risk per unit of return, not counting the market. And one other thing that we should think about when we're talking about risk is investors' attitude toward risk. Are, you know, we think about are we risk averse, are we risk loving, are we risk neutral? Most of us are risk averse and that's where, why I said we prefer the least amount of risk for a given amount of return because we dislike risks and we require a higher return um, in order to invest in those riskier securities. And so a risk premium is what we get to compensate us for holding those riskier securities.